Turn to Colossians this morning, the book of Colossians, and chapter 3. Colossians, chapter 3. Colossians 3. We'll, well, I'll tell you what, we're actually going to start in chapter 2. And uh, since we don't really have a, a special today, I'm going to read. I, I know that in prayer meeting, I know a, a couple Sundays ago, several prayer meetings, last Sunday, Brother Stiles was with us, but I've been going through the book of Colossians, at least some, what, and it's a book really little preached on, but there's a tremendous amount of truth in it. We're going to start in chapter 2, and we're going to read down, and we'll start in verse 12. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, forgiving you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principality and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or drink or in respect of a holy day, or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Verse 18, he gives us a second warning. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility, worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together, increased with the increase of God. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are ye subject to ordinance? Touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using, after the commandments and doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom and will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth, for you're dead, and your life is hid with Christ and God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. And shall we pray. Father, we thank you again for another opportunity. And Lord, give us some clearness. Lord, we sang that song, Open Mine Eyes, that I might see glimpses of truth thou hast for me. Lord, I pray today that you'll open our eyes that we may catch some glimpse of truth that would help us out today. And Lord, that would encourage us today. I thank you for every single person who is here. I thank you again, Lord, for your mercy and your grace. I thank you, Lord, for loving us. Lord, again, I also want to pray for Brother Fielder's son, Ken who has malaria, very sick this morning. Lord, we pray for him. Pray, Lord, that you would raise him up. Lord, restore his health. Lord, that he might be in service for thee. Father, again, I thank you for every single person who is here today. Lord, I pray that you'll meet the need of their heart. Lord, I know everybody carries burdens. I know that we shouldn't. I know that we're commanded to cast all of our care upon you. Lord, help us to do that was not to walk around with burdens that weigh us down, but Lord, to simply trust you. Father, again, we are so thankful for being saved, thankful for heaven. Thank you, Lord, that our sins are forgiven. Thank you, Lord, that you are coming. And Lord, maybe even today, Lord, that would be a great day. So Father, we are again thankful for, uh, Lord, each other. Lord, that song we just sang, Lord, for friends. Lord, we're thankful for brothers and sisters in Christ today. And that's what they are, brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, we thank you for that. Now, Lord, we pray for America, and we pray for Israel. We pray, dear Jesus, that you might, Lord, intervene. Although, Lord, we have so many gods in America, 
I see no reason why we would turn to thee unless, Lord, you send a great revival. It would have to be a Holy Ghost sent revival. Lord, we pray for that tiny nation of Israel. Lord, anti-Semitism is rising in the world again. That which we said could never happen again is happening again. And we pray for Israel. We pray for our Jewish friends. Lord, because they are your brethren, Lord, we pray for them today. Lord, bless we ask in these few moments. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, I, I forgot to mention this. Don't forget, next Sunday, of course, is our dinner. Uh, next Sunday. In the Lord's table next week. I think, I'm pretty sure about this. I'm almost positive about this. I asked my wife. How she would ever know, I don't know. But she, she has a good idea, I think. I was like, now not this, I know this, but I, we, I was 23. I was 23, and my wife was 19 when we got married. And I look back at that and say, whoa. But anyway, 23 and 19. My great-grandmother lived to be 90-some years old. Carol and I were married when she died. As far as I can remember, that was the first funeral I had ever gone to. I had to have been 24 years old. I, I had never gone. I said, well, didn't anybody ever, you know, die? Probably, but I just never went to a funeral. Nobody likes funerals, and, and I had never gone. Now, that wasn't the first dead person I had seen. When I was, uh, let's see, I think Howard and I were like in, uh, about like 12 years old, maybe, maybe 11 years old. Down the road from our house, there was a farm and set on the corner, and there was a, the barnyard had a brick wall to it, and some guy that was drunk came around the corner, and a lady with her husband and three kids were coming the other way, he did not make that corner and drove them into the wall. And she was driving, and she was killed. And I remember going down to Howard's house. Howard lived maybe 75, 80 yards from where we lived, went down there, and he was sitting in the living room. He was kind of sitting there, sitting there. I mean, he wasn't doing anything. He wasn't moving. What's wrong? With, what's wrong? He said, well, there's a dead woman. She's up in that car up there. And so I went down. You know, I went down to, to see, like, you know, a lot of people were around, standing around. She was covered up by that point, but sure enough, she was dead. I think I was the first dead person I ever saw. You know, like my mother said, you're the most cold-hearted person I've ever known in my life, and maybe so, because I went back down to Howard's house and said, let's go outside and play. Well, Howard wasn't in a playing mood at that point, so I just went on back home. Dead. She was dead. She... Well, that has been, I would say I was 12, and that has got to have been 50 years ago. She didn't get up. There wasn't some mistake. She was dead. Uh, her, I'm sure her husband's probably not long dead, but the three girls, by the time I got there, everybody else was gone. The police were there. The ambulance was there. She was still in the car. But she was dead. Since then has been my unpleasant task of having many funerals. I, I don't like funerals. Nobody likes funerals. Nobody likes doing that. Uh, however, let me say this. If I had to have your funeral, it would be a little better than people that I don't know. I've had funerals of people. I had absolutely no idea who they were. They'd call me up and say, well, you have so-and-so's funeral. Somebody said, but you have this person. I, I didn't even know the person. But they're dead. I mean, they're dead. When you're dead, you're not going to get up. You're not going to move around. You are dead. And I want us to center on that verse in Colossians chapter 3 today. The few minutes that we have, it says, For ye are dead. Ye are dead. And your life is hid with Christ and God. You are dead now. Everything proceeding up to that verse. It talks about in chapter 2 that the handwriting of ordinances that was against us was 
contrary to us in verse 14 of chapter 2, he took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, made a show of them openly, triumphing over them. Then he warns us in verse 16, let no man therefore judge you. He warns us again in verse 18, let no man beguile you. Uh, there's some other warnings in Colossians about men coming in and uh, causing problems. Everything up to chapter 3, he then changes, if he then be risen with Christ, and if we're saved, we are. He said, set your affections on things above. And then in verse 3, he gives us the reason why. For you're dead. You are dead. I, I, I know there are other verses in the Bible about being dead, about being dead spiritually. Now, let me just say this. They were not dead in a natural sense. So what do you mean by that? Well, they were not dead physically. He wasn't saying that. That they were, he said, you're not dead physically. It was not that, that kind of a dead dead. It's not that they were dead in a moral sense. Because as it says in chapter 2, if you look at chapter 2 of Ephesians, just back a couple pages, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. It says we were dead. Now the Bible has, is, this is kind of an enigma. Are you right there? Just go back to Galatians chapter 2 for a minute. Galatians chapter 2. Here is a verse that, you know, it, it, stop and think about it for a minute. It says in verse 20 of chapter 2, I am crucified with Christ. Now, before we are crucified with Christ, we are dead. We are dead. We are dead in trespasses and sins. That's what we are. That's what Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1 was saying. Uh, and you hath he quickened who were dead, who were dead, you were dead in trespasses and sin. Now Galatians 2.20 says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Now, now here's a thought. You were dead, spiritually speaking. You were dead. In a moral sense, you were dead. When Jesus died on the cross, he paid for our sins. When we trusted Christ, we were made alive. I am alive in Christ. As Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1 says, and you have to quicken, quicken means made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sin. We were dead, uh, uh, separated, Death is separation from God. When you die, uh, they may put your body out at the funeral home. And uh, let me just say this. If, if, if I die or you die, man, I want my funeral in church. I don't want it down at the funeral home. I want it in church. Amen? And I want it to be, uh, I want everybody to be crying and weeping and wailing and caring. No, I want you to be rejoicing. I know the preacher's gone. He's gone. I'm, I'm glad. He, no, I, and I'm sorry he's gone, but... Uh, uh, man, we need to rejoice over the fact that another saint has gone on to heaven. And if your funeral is because you've gone on to heaven. But when you're dead, you're not really dead. You say, well, the body's not moving around, preacher. That's true. It is not. It's not. The body has ceased to function. But you're still living somewhere. And that's an important truth to remember because there are a lot of people today. I was reading somebody yesterday. Uh, about do, they do not believe in the eternal punishment of hell. Brother, Jesus talked more about hell than he did about heaven. Hell is the real place. But anyway, what happens when we die? When we die, the soul and spirit, they're gone. They either go on to heaven or they go on to hell, one or the other. And uh, so uh, you're not really dead. Now, it tells us in, in uh, Galatians, for I am crucified with Christ. When I was dead, I said, well, well you're dead. Well, what was it? I was separated. What happens at death? Your soul and spirit are separated from body, and you go on to heaven or you go on to hell. When I was dead in trespasses and sin, I was separated from God. I, I was separated from God. Um, and, and we'll see this in a minute. Now, when I got saved, and when you got saved, um, we were made alive. That's what Ephesians 2. And you had to quicken. We were dead. Now, when we got saved, we are now alive. We are alive. But notice 220 of Galatians, I am crucified with Christ. Now, if you got crucified with somebody, no, if you got crucified, they killed you. I mean, if, if Jesus said, if, if, whosoever will bear his cross, let him take up his cross and follow me. If you were going to take up a cross, friend, I can tell you this, you weren't coming back. 
If you took a cross and they were taking you out, you were not coming back. They were going to crucify you. They were going to kill you. So if we look at Galatians 2.20, think of it this way. One, I was dead. When I got saved, I was alive. Now that I'm alive, thirdly, I am crucified. I am now dead again. I am crucified. Here's a spiritual truth. When you got saved, you spiritually were crucified along with Christ on the cross. But now notice what it says. Verse 20. Nevertheless, I live. So now here's the picture. One, I'm dead. Two, I am alive. Three, I am now dead. Four, I am now alive. Well, now notice what else it says. But not I, but Christ lives in me. Well, really, it's not my life, but it's now Christ living through me. And the life that I now live, I live by the, f let me slow down, by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, it says about, to, he says to the Colossians they were dead. Not in a literal sense, physically. Not in a moral sense, because they had been dead to the truth of God, but they had been saved spiritually, and so now they were alive. They were not dead in a legal sense. Legally dead. Look at chapter 2 of Colossians and verse 13. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 13. It says, and now being dead in your sins. What were we dead of? We were dead in sins and, notice what it says, um, and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him. Now notice, and this is important. Having forgiven you all trespasses. Now, if Paul left this out, having forgiven you trespasses, we might have some room to wonder, well, has he forgiven me all my trespasses? Has he forgiven me everything? And so when, I, when Paul says in Colossians 3.3, 3, for ye are dead, he is not saying that they are dead physically, they are not dead, it's not a moral sense, it's not a legal sense, because legally at one point we were dead in trespasses and sins. That's why it says in verse 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, that there was a bill of indictment against us that said I was guilty, that I was dead in my sins, there was a death sentence that had been passed upon you, upon you and upon me. There had been this, and, and we were going to die. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. So in a legal sense, I, I was under the, the judgment of God, and I was going to have to pay for my sin. But when we trusted Christ, it says in verse 14, they blotted out the, blot, they blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. Everything. That goes back again to verse 13. Having forgiven you all your trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. So when Paul says here in, in chapter 3 and verse 3, for you are dead, he was not talking about in a literal sense or a moral sense or even in a legal sense. Because legally, we're not dead. That handwriting that was against us, brother, we're saved now. And all of our transgressions, he's forgiven us all of our sins. Now, you say, preacher, that's kind of a deep thought. Absolutely it is. Sunday school is at 9.30. And you say, well, what's that? Several Sundays ago. Several. Sundays ago, we were talking about many things in Sunday school, but we were talking about the fact that that which is born of God doth not commit sin, and what happens when a Christian dies and has sin in his life. Now, the truth is, I would venture to say that almost everybody in this room will die that way. It's the way it is. Beach here made it, in my opinion, and I told him this, one of the most brilliant things Pete has ever said to me. And Pete says a lot of things to me, but it's the first time, really, it's the first time that I'd ever, I'd ever really seen it. And man, I've been saved for 50 years. And, and I, I can remember Larry Fisher, my friend Larry Fisher, and I have talked about this before. He said, well, what happens when a Christian dies with sin in his life? And, you know, Brother Larry... I always said this, 
Well, I don't know what happens, but I can tell you this, he still goes to heaven. I can tell you this. Uh, I don't know. I do know now. I know now what happens when a Christian dies with sin in his life. I do. They go to heaven. What about the sin in their life? What about the sin in their life? Well, Pete made the observation that in this flesh dwells no good thing. What happens to the sin in our life? I want you to notice this over in chapter 2 of Colossians in verse 11. Here is a, a truth Matt mentioned kind of in passing at the end of the Sunday school hour. But I, I want you to note in verse 11, we could stay here for a long time, but we just simply don't have time. It says, in whom also ye are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. Preacher, what happens to a Christian that dies with sin in his life, as all of us undoubtedly will? Number one, that which is born of God doth come up, not commit sin. When you and I got saved, when you and I trusted Christ, and, excuse me, you and I received Christ, because being saved is more than just believing in God. I mean, the devil believes in God. There are all kinds of people out there. If you stopped the president and said, you believe in God, he would say, well, I believe in God. The kind of God he believes in is not the God you and I believe in. But he said, I believe in God. Most everybody, not everybody, but most everybody say, I believe in God. So being saved is not merely believing God, but it is receiving Christ as our Savior by faith. It is trusting him. Something happened the moment that you and I got saved, and it tells us that in verse 11. In whom also ye are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands and putting off the body of sin of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. When you and I got saved, folks, I mean, you and I got saved. I mean, mark it down, put it down. There's a new creation on the inside. It wasn't a new coat of paint and a new piece of carpet. Let's call it a win. There's a, if any man be in Christ, there's something new on the inside. And there was a spiritual circumcision that took place at that moment that divided that which was born of Christ from that old body of sin in the flesh. He said, well, what happens to a person that's got some sin in their life when they die, preacher? I'll tell you what happens. It goes right in the ground with that body of flesh. That's where it goes. We, the handwriting of ordinances is gone. Now, I know what happens. As Baptist, one of the S's in Baptist stands for soul liberty. We believe, we believe as believers, as, as, as Baptists, we believe in soul liberty. Uh, that's what we believe. Now, I, I want to say, that only goes so far, really. Because there are people who will say, well, you Baptist, you Baptist. Oh, Lord, help us. Don't forget tonight, fellas. Everybody gets five minutes. All you guys get five minutes tonight. Anyway. I seriously thought this morning that I was going to be like Tom Stiles and be done by 20 hours. That's kind of gone by the board. But anyway, when you and I died, when you and I were saved and we died with Christ, all our sins were forgiven. There was a spiritual circumcision that took place. Dividing the new creature in Christ from the old flesh. When you and I die, that new creature in Christ is going to fly away to heaven. The angel is going to come and carry us to heaven. See, so do you really believe that? Absolutely. Absolutely. See, so how do you know that? When Lazarus died, the angels came and carried him. I believe the angels will come and carry us to heaven. You know, we're not going to have to go. I've said this before, and I, I'm, I bet mom was surprised when she died. And I thought, boy, I wonder if she was lonely when, I wonder if she, no, the angels come. And they carry us to heaven. And they, they take us there. Now look, that spiritual circumcision that took place. And you and I, the handwriting of ordinances was blotted out against us. He nailed it to the cross. Spiritual circumcision, boom, took place. Now I know what happens. People who are Arminian in their theology say, well, you Baptist, you think that because you have soul liberty, you can live any way you want and do whatever you want because you believe in the, in the preservation of God. 
Well, number one, I absolutely believe in the preservation of God. The Bible makes it clear that we are preserved by God. I believe that. I believe we're preserved by God. We're going, if we have time, Lord willing, we'll look at it. Look. The Arminians say, well, you Baptists believe you can live any way you want, do whatever you want. And you're still going to go to heaven. You're still going to go to heaven. I don't believe that you can live any way you want. Because it tells us in chapter 3 and verse 1, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. There's my soul liberty. That's my soul liberty. Now, do, do, as Baptists, do, can we disagree? Sure we can. Sure we do. I've said before, I've heard people preach against wire rim glasses. I've heard them preach against wire rim glasses. Uh, I almost, I almost, almost, I almost didn't shave today. You say, you shaved? But anyway, yeah. I'm thinking seriously about my Kenny Rogers impersonation. But anyway, uh, letting my beard grow. Kyle lets his grow, and nobody says anything to him. But, uh, and that, where's that nerdy kid at, Matt? But he let his grow. No shave November, but, uh, you know, hey, I'm a man. I can do it. But anyway, there are other people. I've had guys who would not let me pray in their church because I have a, a, a goatee. They, they wouldn't let me pray. My preacher, my old preacher, God bless him, love him. The first time I preached in his church, I had a mustache. He said, you can't preach here unless you save that mustache. You can't, you can't. He said, preacher, did you? Absolutely. I, I want to do that. Now, look, soul liberty only goes so far. There's, there are things in the Bible that are somewhat grayish. Absolutely. And if you think it's wrong, then don't do it. If I, if I think it's wrong, then I'm not going to do it. If what you're doing, if, if I don't think something's wrong and I do it, don't, you know, if I'm going to offend you or cause you to stumble, Paul's, that's what Paul said about eating meat that offered to idols. He said, I can eat meat. But he said, I won't eat meat if it's going to cause my brother to stumble. See, that's soul liberty. It says, use not your liberty as an occasion to the flesh in the book of Galatians. The Arminians said, well, you guys think you can live any way you want. I've never said that, and I've never preached that, and I don't believe that for one minute. But can we have our differences? Amen. Sure, we can do that. Now, listen, that's one of the things about Baptists. Now, what does it mean, then? What does it mean that we are dead in Colossians 3, 3? For ye are dead. What are we dead to? Well, if you look at chapter 2, and we're not going to do that, just take some time. It, you, it'll help you to understand what 3.3 three means. For ye are dead. Now, they weren't dead in a very, uh, uh, in a, uh, uh, a real sense. They weren't dead in a real sense because they were still alive. They weren't dead in a moral sense because they had been uh, quickened. They weren't dead in a legal sense because the handwriting of ordinances that was against them had been blotted out. They weren't that. What were they dead to? If you read chapter 2 of Colossians, you'll find that Paul is somewhat emphatic about the Old Testament and the Old Testament law. What is it then that we are dead to? We are dead. There are several things that we're dead to. We're dead, of course, to the law. We're dead to the uh, uh, ceremonial law. We're dead to the judicial law. Uh, we're dead to that. Uh, the dietary law, we are dead to those things. Uh, we don't go down to temple every Saturday and offer up a sacrifice we don't, uh, the, the, the preacher, Baptist, one of the things that distinguishes Baptists, one of the things, and I've read some of the things, is that Baptist preachers just dress like everybody else. Now, a lot of churches you go to, you got some guy called Father dressed up like Mama, you know, comes out, and, and uh, 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 we don't do that. Ceremonial, ceremonial, ceremonial. We're dead to the ceremonial law. We, 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 I don't really know what this is. I know yesterday we went, uh, I went with Carol and, uh, you know, got her some presents and she's looking for some boots. Do you know that you, you have a really hard time finding leather boots anymore? Everything on the inside of the boots says man-made material, man-made material. I don't know what man-made material is, but, you know, it's, it's what it is. Everything if, under the ceremony law, well, you can't wear that. You can't wear... 
90% wool and 10% cotton. You can't put a, uh, you can't put an oxen, you can't put a, 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 a jackass in the same yoke. You can't do that. It was against ceremonial law. You can't do that. Uh, it, it, the dietary law. Uh, uh, you know, you can't eat catfish. I said before, one of the, if you go down south, you've got to have fried catfish, coleslaw, french fries, and hush puppies. I'm telling you, that is a meal. But under the dietary law, you can't eat catfish. You can't do that. You, you can't have pork. You can't have pork chops. You can't have ham. Uh, you can't have uh, uh, bacon. My, my brother, my sister-in-law wrapped their turkey in bacon. Yeah, yeah, right. I'm sorry, soul liberty only goes so far. But, you know, it's like, um, the, uh, uh, I maybe lose my thought, but, you know, it's like, uh, uh, you can't eat pork, you can't have, uh, maybe some, anybody ever had pickled uh, 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 pig's feet? Thank you, John. I'll tell you one thing I'll never eat, besides squash and eggplant, is chitlins. You say, what is chitlins, preacher? They're fried hog guts is what they are. When I used to work in Virginia Market, they'd sell them by the 10-pound frozen bucket. And, and, and I'm, not, I'm not trying to be ethnically unclean, but the black folks would come in and they would buy those 10-gallon frozen chitlins, I mean, buy the uh, grocery cart full. You'd have to handle them, put them in the bag. Your hands would stink the rest of the day. But hey! For you with soul liberty, you know, they, it, it, under, the, under the dietary law, you couldn't eat that. We are dead to that. Brother, if you want to try some fi fried chitlins, be my guest. If you want the pickled, uh, I was going to say the pickled pug's feet, but, you know, the pickled pig's feet. If you want to try that, go for it. I know people eat sow's ear. I mean, I, I don't know what it is, but, you know, they, that deal. New Brunswick stew, New Brunswick stew is made by putting a pig's head in the broth, boiling it down, scraping it off, putting in some vegetables and stuff. Actually, it was pretty good. But I see, but now look, look what Paul says, though. I want you to notice this real quickly. Verse 16 of chapter 2. Let no man therefore judge you in meat. Let no man judge you in meat. I mean, don't, don't tell me that. Or in drink or respect of a holy day, high day. Don't, you can't judge. Or it says there, or, or of the new moon or the Sabbath days. No, no, we're free from that. We're dead to that. I listen to some guy on the radio. You know, there are all kinds of nuts on the radio. Eight o'clock on Sunday, there's a nut on the radio. But, you know, there are all kinds of nuts on the radio. And I was listening to some guy uh, on Friday. I was driving down the road listening to some guy. He was preaching about how oh, the Sabbath day is Saturday. And everybody ought to go to church on, if you don't go to church on the Sabbath day, on the Sabbath day, on the Sabbath day. There are a lot of, there are Seventh-day Baptists that believe you ought to go to church on the Sabbath day. The Jehovah's Witnesses believe that if you go to church on Sunday, that's the mark of the beast. I guess we're all marked, amen? But let no man judge you in respect of a holy day. Why? Because our, our, we are dead. We are dead. We are dead to the law. We are dead to the, the, the uh, damning power, if you'll excuse me, of sin. We're dead to that. We've been freed from that. I, I am dead. I am separated before we're saved. Sin has the power to condemn us and to send us all to hell. But brother, I'm dead to that. I'm not going there. You're not going there. We're all saved. We're on, if you're saved this morning, on your way to heaven, we have been freed from the law. We are dead to the law, to the uh, ceremonial law, to the dietary law. We're dead to that. Now the moral law, thou shalt not kill, well... You know, we're still bound by that. I want to remind you about this, that in the New Testament, Jesus repeated every one of the Ten Commandments except uh, about keeping the, the, the Sabbath day. 
Now look, we're free from that. Look, if we wanted to take off every Monday and have church on Monday morning, it may not last too long, but, you know, uh, uh, we could do that if we wanted. If we wanted to have church uh, on Tuesday night instead of Wednesday night, we could do that. If we wanted to have church on Thursday night instead of Wednesday night, we could do that. If we wanted to have a meal every Sunday and never have Sunday night again, we could do that. And somebody said, oh, we ought not to do that, preacher. I felt kind of bad. I, I, not too long, but I felt badly, somewhat, that Wednesday night we didn't have prayer meeting. You know what? I miss church in the middle of the week. I, I do that. I, I miss church. Uh, my friend's son and daughter showed up to church. On, now, they've never been to church here before, but Wednesday night they showed up to church. Oh, we shouldn't have canceled. Let no man judge you in respect to that. We are dead to the ceremonial law, to the dietary law. We are dead to the uh, uh, power of, of sin. We are dead to the world and the things of it. So the Bible is encouraging us in chapter 3 and verse 1. If he then be risen with Christ, we have been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. If he then be risen with Christ, I want, to, I want to say to you again, I said it before, when you got saved, when you got saved, when Jesus died on the cross, we were crucified with him. And all of our sins, all of our transgressions, all of our iniquity, everything was gone. Now, since that is true, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Now, there's my soul liberty. That's, that's what I'm doing. I'm to seek those things that are above. Now, are there things here that you and I uh, uh, can take uh, 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 you know, pleasure in, uh, things that we do. Absolutely, there are things down here that we, that we can do. I, I, I know there, I had a man call me one time because I had called him and, and I said, I'd like to hunt on your property. Could I hunt on your property? Could I hunt on your property? He said, well, yeah. Then he said, what do you think about killing animals? I don't know. My question is to, you know, when people ask me questions, well, what do you think about it? Oh, I'm, I'm against, oh, so am I. You know, the kids on my bus say, what do you think about the Seattle Seahawks? Well, do you like them? Yeah. Oh, I love them too. Somebody else says, well, I hate them. I hate them too, you know. I'm a good politician. But anyway, you know, he says to me, well, I'm not going to let you on my property because I don't think it's right that you kill animals. Okay, pal, no problem. I'll just find somebody else who will let me, you know. Somebody says, I don't think you ought to do that. Okay, that's all right. Then don't do that. Don't do it. If you think that it's wrong to kill uh, 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 a chicken or a pig, don't be a hypocrite. I don't think you ought to shoot deer. Then don't be a hypocrite about it. Don't eat pork. Don't eat fish. Don't eat chicken. Uh, what else is there to eat? Uh, don't, don't eat that stuff. Turkey. There you go. Now listen. You and I have been freed from that, I, I don't have to, I can do that if I want. Now, are there things in this life that you and I can do that, you know, well, preacher, I don't know that out in the woods hunting is necessarily spiritually edifying. Well, I know a ton of people say, well, I can worship God in the fishing boat. I just thought I'd try it, you know. I, I find it somewhat, I enjoy being out in God's world. I mean, I, I enjoy that. And I'm, I'm not just saying the hunting thing, but... I, I know women get spiritual edification out of shopping. I, I don't know what it is, but, I mean, they can go all day shopping. My wife go all day and shop, not buy a thing. You know, I, they get something out of it. But there are things in this life that we can do, that you and I do. And somebody says, well, I don't know that that's right. I don't know that that's wrong. I don't know that that's wrong. I don't know that that's right. There are things that you know. All right? But the Bible encourages us to set our affections on things that are above. Things that are above. Notice what it says, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. That's where Jesus is today, at the right hand of God. So he says, set our affections. And it says in verse 2, again, it says, or verse 1 says, uh, uh, seek those things where, which are above. Verse 2 says, set your affections on things above, not things on the earth. Because let's face it, the things on the earth are going to pass away. In a hundred years, you think about it now, in a hundred years, 
what will anything of this life have mattered? You think about that. All the things that we collect, all the things that we have, all our, and again, I'm not against you having a nice house. I, I, I know just about everybody, if not everybody in here, and everybody has a nice house. Your house may not be as nice as that house, or that house, or maybe better than that house, or that, but everybody lives in a pretty nice house. You say, preacher, is that wrong? No, no, it's not wrong. Until it becomes your God, then, then it becomes wrong. That's why I said set your affections. Look, my house in 100 years is going to be gone. It'll be gone. My clothes, my toys, everything I have is going to be gone. That's why the Bible encourages us to set our affections on things above. So then it comes to verse 3, for ye are dead. All right, we're dead. We're not dead in a literal sense. We're not dead in a moral sense. We're not dead in a legal sense. But we are dead to sin. Uh, we are dead to the things of this world. We are dead to the moral or to the ceremonial and the dietary law. Paul says, don't let anybody judge you. Don't let anybody judge you in that. So then he comes to the second part of verse 3. He says, not only are you dead, not only are you dead, but your life is hid with Christ and God. Number one, it is hid. It is hid. That life that you and I have is hid. That it, it cannot be seen. It cannot be seen. Now, our, our eternal life, that life that we're going to have, that life, this life down here with all of its, its sorrow and sadness, that's going to be gone. That, that will be gone. I love that song. When all my labors and trials are o'er, and I am safe on that beautiful shore. One day, all the sorrow and the sadness and all the heartache and all the tears and all the goodbyes and all the uh, uh, weeping, we say goodbye and, and parting with loved ones here below. We always hope to meet again as on our way we go. But oft our hearts are grieving for those we never again meet. We say goodbye in sorrow but we'll meet at Jesus' feet. We'll never, ever, ever say goodbye in glory. Look, the sorrow and the pain and the heartache of down here, the goodbyes down here, they are sorrowful. The perfection of heaven, the pleasure of heaven, the vision and the enjoyment of God, People often ask the question, what are we going to do in heaven? I don't know. I, I can tell you this. We're going to fellowship with God, and we're going to fellowship with the Son, and we're going to fellowship with the Holy Ghost, and we're going to fellowship with one another, and we'll never, ever, ever say goodbye. The older you get, the older you get. The more you become conscious of your mortality, that you are going to leave this world. And we look at it, and I appreciate what Brother Stiles said. I heard Brother Stiles say this once. I was at a meeting somewhere, and he was preaching. He was talking about a brother who was dying. He said, if you think that dying is easy, you're wrong. He said, dying is kind of hard. But he said, are we in a hurry to die? No, but are we, are we sorrowful about dying? I read something, my, my dad said something to me one time. My mom, one of, my dad or my mom, one of them. My dad did. That's what he said to me. He said, he said uh, preacher, he called, no, he didn't call me preacher. He said, Jim, actually, no, I won't say. He said, Jim, he said, I'd, I'd just soon go on to heaven right now if it wasn't for your mom and your kids. Well, and your kids. And, and I, I understand what he was saying. We're going to say goodbye to all this. The angels, if Jesus should tarry, the angels will come. Now that life, that life, that life is hid. It's hid like a, a treasure. It, it's hid. Now, when you stop and think about it, it, it's hid from the outside world. The outside world cannot see what you and I see. They are alienated. That's what the Bible says we were. We were aliens and strangers from the household of God. The president in his wisdom thinks that by issuing an executive order and by legalizing, and if you think that this is it, this is just merely step one, 
But anyway, he legalized 5 million illegal aliens. Aliens. Now, I'm not saying anything against them. I am not. But you, know, you know what the problem, part of the problem is with that? As, a, as an alien, they, they don't know how to speak my language. We speak American here. We, we, we're, not, we're not really English. We, I mean, it's English, but we speak American. That's what we do here in America. We're Americans, and that's what we speak. They don't speak like we speak. Our little idioms, one of the things about our Vietnamese brothers that were here, they don't, they don't get our little idioms. It says, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's, uh, and you can throw anything in there, little thing. They, they don't get that. People from other countries don't get it. They, they don't speak our language. They don't understand our culture. They, they, don't, they don't get us. They, they don't see, see hard work. That's our culture. The, 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 white Protestant worth, the white Protestant work ethic, that was true in America, where people went out and earned their living. They, they got a job and earned a living. They, they uh, got hired by somebody who expected an honest day's work, and he would give you an honest day's pay. They don't understand that. Uh, I've said before that I probably, I probably, I probably could live in Alabama without too much trouble, probably. But y'all don't talk like us up there. Well, amen. <laughs> you know, I said we speak American up there in New York. But anyway, uh, the culture. I, I could. It, I, I think it would be very hard for a person from the South to come up here and live. One, because of our culture. I mean, New Yorkers are just different. They're nuts. I mean, they're different. And, and, we, and we, we live up here. And it'd be, I think, unless God directly let them up here. But why? They're aliens. See, my life is hid in Christ. And, and people who are outside, they just don't get us. They don't speak our language. They don't, they don't get what it is to be saved. They don't understand what it means to go to church. They don't know why people would go to church. They don't know why you'll come back tonight at 6 o'clock. They don't get Wednesday night. They don't get special meetings. They don't get setting your affections on things above. Why? Because they're aliens. I am dead, and the life that I now live is Hid. It is like a treasure that is hid, and the lost world simply cannot see it. They are alienated from the life of God. They are ignorant of the Lord of life. They don't know who God is. You ask the average, uh, do you believe in God? Yeah. What is God like? I don't know. He's some old gray-haired man that sits up in heaven and kind of winks at everything everybody does. No, he's not. God is not like that. God is omnipotent, God is omniscient, God is omnipresent, God is immutable, God is holy, God is just, God is merciful, God is... Do you realize that most people are ignorant of that? I was ignorant of that. Before I was saved, I was ignorant of the Lord of life. I was ignorant about the Lord Jesus Christ. You've heard me say this before. I knew that Jesus had died on the cross. But the truth of the matter is I didn't know why he died on the cross. I had absolutely no idea. And I had some vague idea that people said, well, he rose from the dead on the third day. I had some vague idea. But once again, I had no idea why he rose from the dead. I had some vague idea that he was, you know, the Bible said the Son of God, but I didn't even know what that meant. The Son of God, I don't know what that means. I was ignorant. Not only was, was I an alien, not only was I an alien from the life of God, but I was ignorant of the Lord of life. I didn't know who he was. I had some vague idea. Jesus, yeah. Yeah. This may sound stupid, silly. There are two things I remember from going to that church that we went to. I won't mention it. One is three things. You say, now, preacher, going to get. One is this. I remember one Sunday, some black people came to our church. That church. And the Sunday school teacher grabbed their books and ran out the door. The second thing I remember is my father was not saved 
he was not saved. He may have been under conviction at that point, but he was not saved. Dad never came to church. He occasionally came to Sunday school. I can remember sitting in the Sunday school room. It was a big room, like the room downstairs. And the adults were in a, like one of our Sunday school rooms. And I remember this tremendous argument going on. I could hear it out there. My father was arguing with the Sunday school teacher. The Sunday school teacher did not believe the Bible was true. The Sunday school teacher, my father being lost, he at least believed the Bible was true. That's the second thing I remember. That's the only two serious things I remember that ever happened in that church. Say, what was the third thing? In that song, do, uh, do your ears hang low? Do they wobble to and fro? Can you tie them in a knot? Can you tie them in a bow? We learned, that, we learned that in Bible school. That's what we learned in Bible school. I was ignorant of the Lord of life. It's hid. It's hid. Now, not only is it hid in verse 3, but let me say this quickly, and we'll be through. It is hid with Christ and God. It's like in a safety deposit box. You know, it's not entrusted to you and I. It's not, it's not left to you and I because we might lose it. I, I once again, really, I, and, I, and I mean this, I'm not saying it because they're sitting here. I love Kyle and I love his boys. I mean, I, I, I love them. I mean, I, I enjoy being around them. And we had a chance, I had a chance to go hunting with them on Friday. We had this first drive. Now, before I get out of the truck, I make sure my keys are in my pocket and it is zipped up. It's zipped. Okay, zipped up. Check three or four times. Leave my wallet, cell phone in the, in the truck. I, I lock the truck. My keys are right there. First drive. Wasn't disappointed. I didn't see a deer, so I wasn't disappointed. Come back to the truck. Unzip my pocket. Get out my keys. Where's the key to unlock the door? I reach back in that pocket. It's gone. Now, I only have one key to unlock the door to the truck. I have two keys to start the truck, but that one, other one was over there. I did have the key to start the truck. All I'm thinking now is Kyle's going to have to shoot out a window so I can get back in the truck. My key is gone. I'm searching in this pocket. I put my hand. I took out. I had a hunt. I had my... Uh, a hunting knife, I had a pocket knife, I had that, that set of keys, I had an extra box of shells, but the other key is gone, and I'm thinking, oh, Lord, we're out here in the middle of nowhere. I don't even have my cell phone to call American Express to send a locksmith out here. Lord, what are we going to do? No, basically, Lord, what am I going to do? What's that? It's the key to the door in my other pocket. You know, the, these magicians, you know, they can take a $20 bill and take it out of this hand and put it behind your ear. One of them must have been standing there because I felt down in my pocket and I pulled it out and I said, thank you, Lord. See, it's not entrusted to me because I could lose it. You know how easy it is to lose? Don't you know how easy it is to lose things all the time? See, my life, my eternal life, is not entrusted to me, but it is hid with Christ in God. It, it's not given to me because somebody might come down here and try and take it from me. It is not given to me because someone might try to defraud it out of me. With a Ponzi scheme. You know, the, way, the only way a Ponzi scheme works is if you got new people giving more money so that the old people can get paid. I don't know if you saw this, but the, the Treasury Department just floated a trillion dollars in new debt, new bonds, so they could pay off the 900 and some billion dollars that just came due. Last. They, have, they have floated a trillion dollars in new debt in the last six weeks. So somebody might defraud me. Now, if I was a suspicious person, I would say that sounds like a Ponzi scheme to me, and they're trying to get something. My life is hid with Christ, and it is laid up. Quickly, look over at 2 Timothy, and we'll, we'll be through. 2 Timothy. 
chapter 1, 2 Timothy chapter 1. You know this verse. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. See, my life is hid. It's like a treasure that is hid, that the world cannot see. And it is hid with Christ and God. Verse 12, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. F. E. Myers, a famous preacher of years gone by, told this story of, of these botanists that had gone to the Alps to look for some rare and exotic flowers. I wouldn't think they would grow, but, but it was a true story. They, they went to the Alps, probably in springtime, summer, or something like that, to find these exotic flowers. One day, one of them had a pair of binoculars, and he saw way down in a crevice, he saw one of the, a flower down there, a quite rare flower, and, but it was way down over the hill, way down in between some rocks. And he saw this little local boy standing there, and he said, he said, son, I want you to go down there and get that for us. He said, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to tie you to this rope, and we will lower you over down into the crevice. And when you get the flower, we'll pull you back up. Well, the little boy was, you know, kind of excited about the adventure, but he was somewhat hesitant about it. And he said to them, wait a minute, I'll be right back. He took off, and a few minutes later, he came back. And he had an elderly man with him. He said, okay, he said, I'm ready to do it now. But he said, that man's going to hold the rope. They said, well, who's that? He said, that's my dad. He'll hold the rope. You and I are held by the hand of God. Our life is hid with Christ. Where is Christ? He's at the right hand of God the Father. Jesus made it abundantly clear in John chapter 10 that he is in the hand of Christ and that no man can pluck them out of my Father's hand. Brethren, we're safe. Our life is here with Christ and God. The Golden Gate Bridge, for a long time, is considered one of the marvels of the world. When they were building the Golden Gate Bridge, the Golden Gate Bridge is the second highest, or the second most used place for suicide in America. Some months, people are killing themselves every three days. It's 450 feet from the bridge, 250 feet from the bridge down to the water. By the time you hit the water, you're going about 75 miles an hour. There have been 34 people who survived jumping from the bridge. Mainly they survived because when they landed, they landed feet first, kind of at an angle. But if you're traveling 75 miles an hour and you hit face first, it's like hitting concrete. One girl actually survived it. She got out and climbed back up and jumped again and killed herself. When they were building the bridge, there was no safety net under it. Twenty-three men died building the Golden Gate Bridge. The last 25% of it, they got an idea. We're going to put a safety net underneath of it. The safety net caught ten men that had fallen to their death. But there was something else they discovered. With that safety net there, they did 25% more work than what they had before. You see, you and I are safe. And I can only remember the last part of that verse. You and I are safe, and underneath are the everlasting arms. I am anchored to Christ. My life is hid. I'm dead. We're dead. We're all dead. We're all dead. We're dead. And my life that I now have is hid with Christ in God. And we're safe. Father, we thank you again for another day. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy and your grace. Now, Lord, help us to set our affection, to seek those things which are above, to set our affections on the things that are above, and to be reminded that we're dead. We are dead. That's why we were dead. We're spiritually circumcised. Lord, we thank you for that truth today. Thank you, Lord, that not only are we dead, but we also have life, and that life is hid with Christ in God, and that we are eternally secure. 
Lord, I thank you for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity one more time to stand up before these folks. Lord, I pray, Lord, that we might have caught a glimpse of something, some truth today. Lord, help us, we ask, to set our affections on things above, to seek those things which are above, where Christ set us on the right hand, because we're dead. And the things of this world should, Lord, begin to lose its luster as we begin to think about that, those things which are above. Lord, as we close, I do pray for Brother Fielder's son, Ken, again, as I know everybody does. Lord, help him, Lord. Bad, bad, serious case of malaria. Lord, we're trusting you, Lord, for a good outcome. Lord, if not, our life is hid with Christ and God, who when Christ shall appear, we shall also appear with him in glory. As about our eyes closed quickly, let me just ask this. Time's up. We're on our way home. Anybody here this morning say, Preacher, I'm not sure. I'm not even sure I'm saved. I believe in God, but, Preacher, I'm not, I'm not sure I'm saved, but I, I sure would like to know that I'm saved. Man, the biggest problem all of you and I, all we've all ever had is this. Our spiritual condition. You say, preacher, I'm not sure I'm saved. If I might pray for you today, I'll pray for you. Gladly pray for you. Anyone, preacher, slip your hand up. I'm not sure I'm saved. All right, Father, don't see any hands. So, Lord, we thank you again for another good day. Lord, bless, we ask as we go. Lord, give traveling mercies, we ask. And bring us back tonight, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. Now,